is substantially true that virtue or morality is necessary spring of popular government. Popular government here is, I think, simply another way of saying Republican self-government, right? That's what he's talking about. The rule, indeed, extends with more or less force to every species of free government. You don't need religion or morality where you have an authoritarian ruler that can sort of compel you with the whip to do what it is that is orderly, right? But it's in free governments that you need this religion and this civic virtue. Who that is, a sincere friend to it, can look with indifference upon attempts to shape the foundation of the fabric. I, I think one thing that strikes me, by the way, in this passage is that the one example, the one sort of really concrete example, is, is the role of honesty in oaths. Right? Think about how important honesty in oaths is. Think about contracts, business relationships. <coughs> We really couldn't survive, right? It's kind of the grease is this kind of sense of we take a seriously. So, so I just thought I'd find that sort of interesting. But, so I summarize this passage in this way. Three things that I think really jump out at me from this passage. One is religion, morality, or indispensable supports for political prosperity. Second, morality cannot be maintained without religion. And third, the enemy of true religion, or one who would undermine the public role of religion, is a danger to civil society and political prosperity. And I want to look at each of these points a little bit more closely. The first is a recurring theme in Washington's writings. He says, for example, in a letter to the Dutch Reformed Church in 1789, true religion affords the government its surest support. That's back to that indispensable support of political prosperity. In a letter to the Philadelphia clergyman in 1797, he says religion and morality are the essential pillars of civil government. Here's someone else saying something similar, writing in 1799 with the anti-Christian impulses of the French Revolution in mind, and employing imagery reminiscent of Washington's farewell address, Patrick Henry observes this. He says, and see if you hear echoes of the farewell. The great pillars of all government and of social life are virtue, morality, and religion. This is the armor, my friend, and this alone that renders us invincible. These are the tactics we should study. If we lose these, we are conquered and fallen indeed. Now, you've, if you've heard me in this class before, you're going to have seen this slide, next slide, over and over again, okay? Because it's my effort to visually represent what's being said here, right? If we desire to have life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, we have to have social order and stability. Republican self-government is really the best way to achieve that. But you can't have Republican self-government unless you have morality and civic virtue. And what feeds that morality and civic virtue but religion and a vibrant religious culture? Okay? I think this kind of summarizes what's, what's being said here. Now, I'm going to add one element that's not in the farewell, but I do think you see it over and over again, is that a really desirable precondition to create these foundations, these various levels of foundation, is religious liberty, because that's what's going to unleash that moral voice. It's going to unleash the church and, and moral spokesmen to sort of inform that, that, that religion and, and, and feed it and, and allow it to, to grow and thrive. Now, the literature of the American founding era, I'm going to say to you, is replete, replete with statements to this effect. And I really can spend several classes just going through them, and I, I probably will overdo it as it is. But here's just a couple, right? Here's John Adams saying, statesmen, my dear sir, may plan and speculate for liberty, but it is religion and morality alone which can establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump to my next slide. Now, this is a really interesting one because this comes from a, 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 an election sermon, essentially. In the state of Massachusetts, and uh, it is delivered in October of 1780 on the occasion of the introduction of the new constitution of Massachusetts. This is the new constitution of 1780. And it's literally, it's delivered by Samuel Cooper, who was the pastor of the Brattle Street Church, which is the most prominent Congregationalist church in Boston. But he literally delivers it in front of the governor, the, the lieutenant governor, and every member of the legislature and judicial branch of Massachusetts is literally in front of him as he delivers this sermon. And this is what he says. He says, our civil rulers will remember that as piety and virtue support the honor and happiness of every community, they are peculiarly requisite in a free government. 
Virtue is the spirit of a republic, for where all power is derived from the people, all depends on their good disposition. If they are impious, factious, and selfish, if they are abandoned to idleness, dissipation, luxury, and extravagance, if they are lost to the fear of God, which is another way of saying righteousness, and the love of their country, all is lost. Having gone beyond the restraints of a divine authority, they will not broke the control of laws enacted by the rulers of their own creating. Now, one man we know who was in the audience and heard this sermon was the governor, whose name? John Hancock. A week later, he gives the State of the Commonwealth Address. Listen to if you hear echoes of, of Cooper in this address. This is one week later. Sensible of the importance of Christian piety and virtue to the order and happiness of a state, I cannot but earnestly recommend to you every measure for their support and encouragement that shall not infringe the rights of conscience. Manners by which not only the freedom but the very existence of the republics are greatly affected depend much upon the public institutions of religion and the good education of youth. Is that education and morality those twin pillars again. Now this is a theme that Hancock returns to over and over and over again. Here's a couple of excerpts from succeeding state of the state uh, addresses that he gives. He writes, children, he says, children not exposed to a regular gospel ministry and proper Christian education are in danger of being deprived of the ideas, habits, and abilities they need to be good and useful citizens. Hancock exhorted legislators to pass laws that promote habits of truth, integrity, and every moral virtue, and deter frauds and every immorality and vice, encourage people to revere Christianity, respect virtue, and exhibit humanity, honesty, sincerity, piety, justice, moderation, temperance, industry, and frugality. So we know what virtues are important to him. And help regard and help guard the hearts of citizens against, and now we know what <coughs> vice it's concerned with. Depravity and corruption by discouraging blasphemy and profanity, lewdness and temperance, gambling, idleness, levity, and dissipation of manners. <clears throat> Lest you think this is just Congregationalist New England, here's Roman Catholic Charles Carroll saying, Without morals, a republic cannot subsist any length of time. They, therefore, who are decrying the Christian religion, whose morality is so sublime and pure, are undermining the solid foundation of morals, the best security for the duration of free governments. This is said in November 1800, which almost certainly was said with the prospects of the election of Thomas Jefferson in mind, which is exactly that enemy of Christian morality that I think uh, uh, Charles Carroll is, is concerned about. So what, what is all this about? Here's my effort to try to summarize it. The founders believed that religion and morality were essential to a regime of republican self-government because they provided the internal moral compass that would prompt citizens <coughs> to behave in a disciplined, controlled manner, and thereby promote social order and political stability, obviating the need now for that whip in the rod, right? You don't need the whip in the rod if you have that internal moral compass. Besides, the whip in the rod is unacceptable for a free, self-governing people. Now, this was not an argument in favor of an established church or compelled allegiance to a particular creed or bishop. Rather, the argument was that the political order must encourage religion because religion nurtures the civic virtues and strengthens the internal monitors that give citizens a capacity for self-government. The idea here was, and you hear this, this kind of metaphor over and over again, is that a free people have to make a choice, right? You have two choices. One is you can choose to be governed by the whip and the rod. That's how beasts are controlled. Or you can, you can choose to be nurtured by those internal sort of moral monitors that religion and civic virtue uh, have to provide. In the, in the political literature of the American family, I, I, I find numerous descriptions of the Bible as the most Republican book ever written. Now, I find this a curious expression, because, you know, when I pick up my Bible, I think to myself, oh, by the way, I've got the most Republican book here in my Bible. So I'm always kind of caught by that, that expression, and it comes up over and over and over again. In what sense is the Bible a Republican book? Well, I want to sort of give you an illustration. 
of that sense. Here is John Adams, writing in 1807. He says, believing that without national morality, a Republican government cannot be maintained, and that the Bible contains the most profound philosophy, the most perfect morality, and the most refined policy that ever was conceived upon earth, John Adams described the Bible as the most Republican book in the world, right? This is why it's Republican, because it provides that sort of that nurturing of morality that a Republican self-governing people must have. So, let's, uh, let's remind ourselves that Washington goes on in the farewell to talk about morality cannot be maintained without religion. <clears throat> he also says, and again, I find this rather startling, that the enemy of true religion is a danger to civil society and political prosperity. He says that very explicitly in the farewell address. Now, again, He's not an outlier here. I could give you example after example after example of people saying exactly the same thing. Here's an election sermon from 1797 in Connecticut. Listen to it. I think it's a very interesting passage. Public virtue and political prosperity are intimately connected. Righteousness will exalt and vice bring ruin on a people. That's a quote. That's really a paraphrase of Proverbs 14, 34, I think, right? Um, if then we are true <coughs> patriots, if then we are true patriots, if it is our glory really to be, as well as to be esteemed the friends of our country, we shall devote ourselves to the sincere practice of true godliness, and in our several stations faithfully endeavor its universal promotion. Enmity to religion is inconsistent with true patriotism. They who are either publicly or privately undermining the foundation of piety toward God are weakening the force of moral obligation and aiming a fatal blow against the dearest privileges resulting from the social compact. If you're laboring to undermine that public role of virtue and morality, you can't call yourself a patriot, I think is what's being said here. <coughs> now, to shift gears, notwithstanding the founding generation's belief that religion, specifically biblical Christianity, fostered good moral character and civic virtue in citizens and governors, they also believed man was a fallen creature, desperately wicked, desperately wicked. This is a belief, of course, rooted in Scripture and in Reformed theology. So we read in places like Job 15, what is man that he should be clean? And, he, and which is born of a woman, that he should be righteous. Behold, he put no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water. We drink in filth and sin almost as naturally as we take in water. Right? But this is over and over expressed in Scripture. We'll remember Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And you know the passages better than I do. Now, this is a view of man and human nature reflected in the political thought of the founding fathers. Uh, a year or two ago, just as an experiment, I read through the Federalist Papers with a single eye to try to identify every passage that, that refers to human nature. Okay? So what did we learn from the Federalist Papers about human nature? Well, here, and, and I could, again, spend a lot of time on this, but here are just a few examples. Okay? Number six, men are ambitious, vindictive, vindictive and rapacious. Number ten, the latent causes of faction are thus sown in the nature of man. Faction, of course, reflects man's most base, selfish, oppressive, vexatious, and mischief, mischievous impulses. Number fifteen, why has government been instituted at all? Because the passions of men will not conform to the dictates of reason and justice without constraint. A love of power and biased disregard to the public will results from the constitution of human nature. Number 37, the infirmities and depravities of the human character. Number 55, there is a degree of depravity in mankind which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust. And we could go on and on. But what are the political implications of this? Well, I think the founding generation would have said something like this. Because of man's radically depraved nature, the founding generation knew that mankind's internal moral compass, refined by religious instruction, would be indispensable to, but here's the money quote, but inadequate for political self-government. Okay? It's vital to, but it's not enough. 
Society could not depend solely on civic virtue to maintain the social order and discipline essential to self-government. <coughs> the founding generation believed that God ordained civil government and its laws to excite men to good works and to be a terror to evil works. Now, I would suggest that this plays itself in this fashion, right? A recognition of original sin and mankind's radical depravity prompted the founders to design a constitutional system that would prevent the concentration of power and check the abuse of power vested in fallen human agents. And one cannot appreciate the most fundamental features of American constitutional design, things like limited government, federalism, separation of powers, checks and balances, rule of law, without understanding the reform doctrine of radical depravity and the intended necessity to check mankind's fallen nature. Probably the most famous quote to all of those of us in this room from the Federalist Papers comes from number 51. Where? James Madison. He says, because men are not angels, <coughs> ambition must be made to counter ambition. That's why we need checks and balances, right? Um, and many in the founding generation believed separation of powers and checks and balances were biblical concepts established by God in his plan for governing the children of Israel. If I had more time, I could uh, give you examples uh, to illustrate that. Well, we come to that point where we decide do we take the long version or the short version? Go <laughs> 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 long. Okay, part two. So I'm going to conclude I want to conclude, as I started, with several quotations from important founders that I think are, are going to summarize some of these themes that we've been talking about. And I'm going to, I'm going to start with uh, John Adams again. This comes when he's still a relatively young man in an essay he writes. But listen to what he says. He says, and liberty cannot be preserved without a general knowledge among the people who have a right from the frame of their nature to knowledge. But besides this, and this is where I really want you to sort of key in, but besides this, they have a right, an indisputable, an alienable, indefeasible, divine right to that most dreaded and envied kind of knowledge. I mean of the character and conduct of their rulers. This is important. This is really, really important in a system of self-government. Here's Sam Adams again. Okay. Long quote, but bear with me. He says, Neither the wisest constitution nor the wisest laws will secure the liberty and happiness of a people whose manners are universally corrupt. He therefore is the truest friend to the liberty of his country who tries most to promote its virtue, and who, so far as his power and influence extend, will not suffer a man to be chosen into any office of power and trust who is not a wise and virtuous man. We must not conclude merely upon a man's haranguing upon liberty and using the charming sound that he is fit to be trusted with the liberties of his country. It is not unfrequent to hear men declaim loudly upon liberty who, if we may judge by the whole tenor of their actions, mean nothing else by it but their own liberty to oppress without control or the restraint of laws all who are poor or weaker than themselves. The sum of all is, if we would most truly enjoy this gift of heaven, let us become a virtuous people. Then shall we both deserve and enjoy it. While on the other hand, if we are universally vicious and debauched in our manners, though the form of our constitution carries the face of the most exalted freedom, we shall in reality be the most abject slaves. Finally, I want to conclude with a passage uh, from the Patriot preacher John Witherspoon. John Witherspoon uh, is a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was also, uh, at the time of this statement, he was the president of the College of New Jersey in Princeton. He was also the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in America. And I want to sort of draw your attention to a passage from a uh, from a, a speech that he gives in 1782. And it is a speech delivered specifically on the end of the war with Great Britain. And uh, so victory has been achieved, but in a way, 
something even bigger is in front of them, right? This daunting task of creating a new nation, right? Of establishing the political institutions of a new government. And so it's with that sort of daunting task before them, he says this. I hope none here will deny that the manners of the people in general are of the utmost moment to the stability of any civil society. When the body of a people are altogether corrupt in their manners, the government is ripe for dissolution. Those who are vested with civil authority ought also, with much care, to promote religion and good morals among all under their government. <coughs> if we give credit to the Holy Scriptures, he that ruleth, ruleth must be just, ruling in the fear of God. I think he's making reference here, by the way, to Exodus 18.21. Remember, Exodus 18.29 is a very interesting passage because this is when the children of Israel have just kind of come across the Red Sea and Moses is trying to do everything, right? And his father-in-law, Jethro, comes to him and says, Moses, you're going to drive yourself to an early grave unless you get some help. You need to get some other people to help you govern and this nation. And, and he says, you need to find people who are able men, who fear God, who hate covetousness, right? And he lays out the very qualities and virtues uh, that Moses should look in, in civil rulers, essentially, civil magistrates. So I think that's what he's, he's referring to when he says, he that ruleth must be just, ruling in the fear of God. It is a truth of no little importance to us in our present situation, not only that the manners of a people are of consequence to the stability of every civil society, but that they are of much more consequence to free states than to those of a different kind, right? This is back to that theme. The civic virtue is vitally important in a system of self <coughs> in ways that it might not be if you have an authoritarian ruler who can sort of bring that whip in the rod to bear. In free states, where the people, where the body of the people have the supreme power properly in their hands, and must be ultimately resorted to on all great matters. If there be a general corruption of matters, there can be nothing but confusion. <clears throat> so true is this, that civil liberty cannot be long preserved without virtue. A republic once equally poised must either preserve its virtue or lose its liberty. Those, therefore, who pay no regard to religion and sobriety in the persons whom they send to the legislature of any state are guilty of the greatest absurdity and will soon pay dear, dear for their folly. Let a man's zeal, profession, or even principles as to political measures be what they will. If he is without personal integrity and private virtue as a man, he is not to be trusted. Whatsoever state among us shall continue to make piety and virtue the standard of public honor will enjoy the greatest inner peace, the greatest national happiness, and, every, and in every outward conflict will discover the greatest constitutional strength. Mm -hmm. I think this more or less says it all. Everything you'd want to know about the views of the founding fathers on the importance of character and civic virtue in a self-governing republic. I think is encapsulated in this brief passage. Maybe we could even summarize it more by saying character counts. Character counts. <coughs> we thank you, Lord, for the liberty that you give us. We thank you for your word and for what it instructs us, and how it instructs us and how it teaches us to, uh, to behave. We pray, Lord, now as we go into the worship service that you might accompany us and that the Holy Spirit will be present for you. We pray this in our sense of your name.